and Nature Center and the Ann Arbor Hands Eye Museum. And today, we're gonna dive into the world of herpetology, focusing on animals we call reptiles and amphibians, two main groups of cold-blooded creatures. For today, we'll be learning more on how to best classify or be able to identify animals in those two groups, what features and behaviors we use to do so, and how these two animal groups are both in common or have similarities and how we can explore the differences. Even though they're often studied together, there's a whole range of diversity between the two animal groups. Let's take a closer look at how we can better discover or explore these animals we find out in the wild. Herpetology is the study of reptiles and amphibians. In Michigan, we have a wide range of biodiversity in each of those animal groups. However, while they are studied together, they actually don't have much in common. While we sometimes find them in some other habitats, or while they may have some physical and physiological similarities, oftentimes we're easily able to separate them based on other physical features we see or observe out in the wild. Therefore, herpetologists have to have an incredibly wide range of knowledge of not only each animal group, but also how to best classify them or how to be able to use certain features and observations they see to better tell those animals apart. One of the best tools that we can use to help understand the similarities and differences between reptiles and amphibians is something called a Venn diagram. A Venn diagram allows you to look at multiple groups and categorize them how they differ and how they're similar. Each circle represents what you are studying. When you draw a Venn diagram, the circles intersect, leaving a space where both circles come together. This area is where you place what your groups have in common. The other spaces are where you place what each group has that is unique to that specific group. When studying herpetology, we can use a Venn diagram to better organize what makes reptiles and amphibians different. Let's start on the amphibian side. The word amphibian means both lives. That's because amphibians typically spend part of their life in or underwater and then the other part on land. In order for that to occur, amphibians start their life cycle in these jelly-like eggs, or they lay eggs with a jelly, slimy texture. They sometimes look like gooey eyeballs. Well, what's happening is this gooey texture is a layer protecting these eggs to make sure they don't dry out. Oftentimes, amphibians lay their eggs in the water too, so that when they hatch, their babies can survive. That's because most young amphibians have gills or can breathe underwater like a fish. It's not until later in their life cycle that they develop lungs and then are able to survive on land. Besides jelly-like eggs, amphibians don't have claws. Some will have more toes on their front feet versus their back, but they don't need claws in order to move. Many of them have webbed feet to swim underwater or can bury themselves into the ground by using their powerful legs. Amphibians have smooth, wet skin. Amphibians breathe or drink using their skin. In order for that to work, their skin must be wet. While some amphibians have bumps to blend in with their environment, they don't have scales. Rather, they form a mucus or slime-like layer on the top of their skin to help hold moisture or to protect their skin if the habitat becomes too dry. The amphibian group includes frogs, toads, newts, and salamanders, all of which we have right here in Michigan. Let's take a look at a native Michigan amphibian and see if we can find those features that best describe or classified them in the amphibian group. Here we have an eastern tiger salamander, a native Michigan amphibian, and our largest terrestrial salamander. We have over 10 species of salamanders and newts here. Now, right away I can tell it's an amphibian just by looking at its skin. It has this smooth, sleek, wet appearance along its body, no scales. And we know amphibians use their skin to absorb water or be able to drink just by using it too. Some can even breathe. That's also why I'm wearing gloves. There are sometimes things on my hands that can actually get soaked into this animal skin and make it sick. So I wear gloves 
to make sure it doesn't soak anything harmful through its skin. I also can look at its feet and note that it doesn't have any claws. It has four toes on its front and five toes on its back. One way to be able to identify tiger salamanders from other kinds of salamanders and newts. Now, tiger salamanders are pretty common here in Michigan. We often find them in our wetland habitats. And amphibians, like salamanders, are called bioindicators. Because they soak nutrients, water, and more through their skin, that means they're often sensitive to pollutants. So if you find an amphibian, like a salamander, in a habitat, it's a pretty good indication that that habitat is healthy or clean for those animals, not a lot of pollution. This animal is also a voracious carnivore, able to eat many different kinds of insects, macroinvertebrates, even small fish or other smaller amphibians. However, usually when we think of amphibians, we think of frogs and toads. And while this animal has some physical appearances like it, you'll see that adult salamanders, unlike frogs and toads, keep their tail. This is to help them swim or move out the water better. If they don't always have webbed feet, they can use their tail like a rudder, moving themselves back and forth in an S-like motion to push themselves through the water. But like frogs and toads, they lay those jelly-like eggs and their babies have to stay underwater because they often have gills like a fish and can only breathe under the water too. They also go through that specific life cycle we call metamorphosis to where when they are adults, many can develop lungs and therefore be able to survive on land. Pretty cool, right? Salamanders are a great representation in amphibians and have very unique skills in order to survive in the wild, particularly in an area with four different seasons. But let's move on now to our reptile category. Typically, reptiles include animals such as snakes, lizards, turtles, crocodiles, and a really unique creature called a tuatara. But like amphibians, there are physical features we use to best classify them and tell them apart from other animals. First, reptiles have a very different kind of skin. Reptiles possess these dry scales all over their body. This feature is one of the main reasons why reptiles can live on land and are sometimes found in the harshest, driest climates. These dry scales can sometimes act like armor, protecting these reptiles from other elements. But it also keeps moisture in and they have oils in order to keep the scales smooth as they move about on the ground. Reptiles also shed their skin their entire lives, sometimes in one big long swoop or in tiny little pieces. That way they constantly have new, fresh, dry scales to better protect what's inside their body and to be able to move about in different climates and habitats. Reptiles also lay their eggs on land, not in water. Unlike amphibians, reptiles have a solid leather-like shell that protects the baby reptile inside. While their shell isn't as hard as a chicken egg, this adaptation also allows reptiles to occupy more land habitats or areas away from water. Reptiles that have legs also always have claws, another big difference between them and amphibians. However, not all reptiles have legs but possess the other main physical characteristics. Just like with a group of amphibians, different kinds of reptiles also have their own unique set of features that we use to classify them or tell them apart. For example, lizards have ear holes, whereas snakes do not. Turtles have a shell, whereas no other reptile does. While they may all possess scales or those that have legs have claws, the other different or unique physical features within each kind of reptile group is also how we're able to tell different reptiles apart. There's just so much variety within each of these groups, though that sometimes those physical features aren't enough, or we have to look at multiple features and behaviors to best classify and place these animals in the correct group. This is also why some herpetologists focus on studying just specific kinds of reptiles or amphibians, because there's so much diversity. But let's try to go ahead and meet a reptile, see if we can classify why it's reptile to begin with, and then determine what other features we see to help us understand what kind of reptile it could be. The reptile we're gonna talk about today are turtles. Now, this turtle is an eastern box turtle, a native but not very common species we find in Michigan. And turtles, like other reptiles, 
have claws, since they have legs, dry scales, and can lay their eggs on land. They also bury them in the sand or loose soil. But turtles are unique as reptile because they are the only reptile group that possesses a shell that they are born, grow, and live in their entire lives. And that part of their anatomy possesses some unique adaptations or ways for them to survive. For example, a turtle shell is often shaped, sized, or has colors dependent on where they live. Eastern box turtles are considered land turtles because they spend most of their time on land. So this turtle shell kind of looks like a rock or maybe leaf leader, a piece of a tree. It's also rounded to look like a rock too. Oftentimes turtles that swim or live most of their lives in the water have a very flat shell or streamlined, making it easier for them to swim. They'll often have webbed feet too to be able to push better through the water. A turtle's shell also comes in two different parts. We have the top part here called the carapace, and then the bottom part called the plastron. There's also usually a bridge that connects the two. And a turtle lives its entire life inside its shell because its skeleton is attached to a shell too. If you find your uh, backbone or your rib cage, this animal's backbone and ribs are actually attached to the top part of its shell. But its hip bones, shoulder bones, and more are attached to all different parts to where a turtle can never live its life outside of its shell. They also typically use their shells to protect themselves, like a big sheet of armor. But box turtles are unique in that respect because they can box themselves inside their shell 100%. How? Well, box turtles possess a very flexible plastron, or bottom part of their shell. There's actually a line here that kind of acts like a door hinge. When this animal feels threatened, it'll take its shell and push it over its head, over its legs, and beyond its tail to where it looks completely like a rock, not even a live animal. Most turtles don't have a shell that can cover their entire body, let alone a big enough plastron that's flexible to do just that job. This also means that turtles can occupy a wide arrangement of habitats, just like other reptiles, including deserts or arid regions, being able to live in the oceans or the sea, and other various wetland or temperate areas that we can find even right here in Michigan. But the cool thing is, is thanks to those obvious physical features, we can easily tell this has to be a reptile and not related to amphibians. Phew, man, that's a lot of information. And we've only just scratched the surface when it comes to herpetology. But we still have one final part of our Venn diagram, and that's what these two animal groups have in common. Let's take a closer look and see if we can fill in the rest of our circles and understand why herpetologists might end up studying both of these animals together in the first place. Both reptiles and amphibians are what we call cold-blooded creatures. You can also use the word ectotherm, which basically means outside temperature. Cold-blooded creatures cannot make themselves warm, but rather rely on the external temperature, the temperature around them, to help regulate their own body temperature. We humans are called endotherms. That means that we can regulate our body temperature to be one temperature throughout the entire day. We do so by eating a lot of food or running around, getting a lot of exercise or giving ourselves a really big hug. Because of how our internal structures work, particularly our digestive system or what's called our metabolism, we're able to keep a certain amount of heat inside our bodies to stay one body temperature throughout the whole day. Ectotherms or cold-blooded creatures can't. They rely on the external temperature, which is why we often see these animals basking in the sunlight to stay warm, or why we don't see a lot of cold-blooded creatures out and about in the wintertime. It takes a lot of energy to try to keep one body temperature for us, and if their metabolism is different, that means they also have more or less energy based on how warm or cold the animal gets. Also, amphibians and reptiles are what we call vertebrates. This means that they have a backbone and a skull. You can check yourself to see where your backbone and skull is by finding the bumps that run along the middle of your back or by touching gently on your noggin to make sure you have a nice hard surface. Those two anatomical or skeletal features are what we use to classify any vertebrates. Things like insects, arachnids, or other animals that may live in the water like sea cucumbers or sea stars, they're not vertebrates or what we call 
invertebrates. They possess different bone structures, or maybe their bones are made of a different material, like the shell of a crab or a lobster, or the exoskeleton of a spider or a bee. Other similarities could include having internal structures like a heart, or being able to hibernate, or something we call brumate, or even living in the same habitat. However, many other animals have those same features, so we don't often use them to look at how reptiles and amphibians are unique. While this is just an introduction to herpetology and animal classification, there's so much more you can do. Feel free to create your own Venn diagram and try to compare not only these two animal groups we mentioned, but other plants and animals and living things we find on our planet. Maybe you can even try to see if you can feature some of the behaviors that these reptiles and amphibians do. Can you bask in the sun like a lizard? Can you build a shell to protect yourself like a turtle? Can you sit in a puddle and soak up water through your skin like a frog? Feel free to try these experiments and activities at home to get a better understanding of the life of reptiles and amphibians. We also hope that you've had the chance to continue exploring other parts of the natural world and wish to thank you for participating in our lesson about herpetology today. Enjoy your time outdoors and keep exploring everybody!